Hi, I'm Doraline. Welcome to my farm kitchen. Today I'm going to be making a loaf of white sourdough bread and I'm going to take you through the process step by step. I've been baking sourdough for just about 11 years and I am self-taught. I've made a lot of mistakes and I'm hoping that by sharing my uh, recipe and my step-by-step -step process on how I make it that you can avoid some of the downfalls that I had when I first started. This is an 800 gram loaf and it's about a 76 percent hydration. It's a fairly wet dough but it produces a nice open airy crumb on the bread that's nice and moist but not doughy. I measure all my ingredients so we're going to start by putting a bowl on the scale. We're going to measure in grams and I've hit the tear button to take it to zero. I start with 100 grams of starter is going to be just about everything I have in this jar. I put my scale back to zero and I add 290 grams of water. This is just lukewarm. If you wanted to slow the process down a little bit and buy yourself a little bit of time, you could start with a cooler water. I'm going to add this to my mixing bowl and I'm going to stir it up. We're going to incorporate all of our starter into the water, getting out most of the larger lumps. I don't worry about getting them all out. I'll let that set for a second. I have a dry bowl. I'm going to put that to zero. And I'm going to add 400 grams of bread flour. This is a King Arthur bread flour. And while I have the scale going, I'm going to put 12 grams of kosher salt. I use a diamond kosher salt, so it's a larger flake and it appears to be a lot, but it's really what I think tastes best in this loaf. I have my 400 grams of bread flour and I'm going to put approximately half of it in the bowl and I'm going to stir it up. And I do it in two increments, that way I can incorporate the flour. We're just looking for a rough mix at this point. I'm going to sprinkle on the salt, I just put that over the top, and I incorporate that in. I do use a dough whisk. You don't have to have one, you can certainly use a fork or spoon, whatever works for you. And I add the second half of the flour. I would use a deeper bowl probably than what I've got here, but I want to allow you to be able to see into the bowl so you can see exactly what's happening. I'm not looking to turn this into anything that's smooth at this point. So I've incorporated most of my flour, and at this point it looks almost like a sticky cookie dough. And that's all I'm going to do, just to let it sit. So, especially on this first one, it can sit a little longer because I do think it helps hydrate all of the flowers. But I'm going to set the timer just for the sake of being consistent for 30 minutes. And we're going to cover that up and I'll come back. It's been about 30 minutes since we first mixed our dough. You can see that the consistency has already changed. It's starting to absorb quite a bit of the flour. I have a dish of water here to dip my hands in just to help the dough let go of me and I have a plastic dough scraper that I'm going to use to help me loosen up the dough from the bottom of the bowl. I'm going to dip my hands in and this is pretty much a four-way stretch. So I start by giving it a little tug, turning, giving it a little tug. Hung. all four directions almost like an envelope fold and then just for good measure I do a couple more just to help me pull in some of the extra bits of flour. You want to be quick with your movements uh, so that the dough doesn't grab a hold of you. I put a little bit of water on top of the dough, not much, just to keep it from forming a skin. 
and then we'll come back and do our second stretch and fold in just about 30 minutes. My dough has been resting just about 30 minutes. It already is taking on a different appearance and it has a slight gloss to the dough. And we're going to do the same process as we did with our first stretch and fold. We're going to dampen our hands. I'm going to loosen up the dough. And I'm going to give it a nice tug. It already has a little more gluten development at this point. I'm getting a nicer stretch out of it. It's fairly cool in here today. I've got the windows open. It's early spring. If the room was warmer, the stove would ferment a little faster. The resting period is very important to the sourdough process, so don't rush that. Um, I would err on the side of going a little longer instead of going shorter in your rest periods. I'm working in the house today, so 30 minutes is fine for me. I just set the timer as a reminder not to forget to check the dough. I know trying to figure out a schedule to bake sourdough can be difficult for people who work away from home. For the first seven to eight years of baking sourdough, I did work full time off the farm and I had a Sunday bake schedule and I'll share that with you. I've started teaching sourdough classes this year here in the farmhouse. Many of my sourdough students have a full-time job away from home and trying to figure out how do they work it into their schedule can be a little bit intimidating. So I've come up with a Sunday bake schedule and I'll share that with you. So on my board in the kitchen, I have my sourdough formula. Over here is just a Sunday bake schedule. So if your house is fairly cool, you could feed your starter on a Friday night, let it sit overnight somewhere cool, Saturday morning around 8 a.m., like to start baking early in the morning, and then that way I don't have any interruptions. So 8 a.m. you would mix the dough, 8.30 you would do your first stretch and fold, 9 o'clock your second stretch and fold, 9.30 your last stretch and fold, and then you're going to let the dough rest three to four hours depending on the room temperature. The warmer it is, the more active it's going to be. Around 12.30 or 1, you'll pre-shape your dough and prepare your banneton. And we do that by lightly dampening the banneton and coating it really heavy with rice flour. You don't want to use regular flour in that process. And then we're going to shape our dough and we're going to put it into the banneton. I'm going to cover it and refrigerate it. And that's going to be right around 1.30 and refrigerate it overnight. Sunday morning, I get up really early, but for the normal individual who does it, I would say get up, you know, start your oven around 8 a.m. at 500 degrees preheating. I like to preheat it at least an hour. That makes a big difference. If your oven's not really hot, you won't get that oven spring that you're looking for. 9 a.m., I'm going to score the dough, transfer it to the oven, and bake it, and then you'll let it cool so you could have it for dinner. It seems like a lot, but those periods of stretching and folding only take about a minute to stretch and fold. This is the schedule I use. Okay, it's been just about 30 minutes. Once again, you can see that the dough has a nice gloss to it. We're going to take our dough scraper, loosen it up, and I'm going to do our last stretch and fold. There are a lot of variables with sourdough, depending on how ripe your starter was when you did the initial mix. If your starter was a little on the thinner side and on the deflation part of growth, so when you feed your starter, you have your little bit in the jar, you add your water, you add your flour, you stir it really well and it'll start to rise. And when it hits the peak is right about the time I like to use it or a little under that. If it goes past that stage and starts to deflate, you're going to find your dough is going to be really loose and you can work through that by manipulating the dough and building some gluten unless the dough has gone absolutely too far but most times i can resurrect it by adding three or four more stretches and folds so if your dough is really loose don't be discouraged just be a little more vigorous in your stretching and folding after your third stretch and fold if you feel like it wants to act wonky Go ahead and do a couple more series of stretch and folds, maybe 15 minutes apart. I know it's difficult to not have some certainty in the instructions, but that is the nature of sourdough. Temperature of your water, temperature of your room, temperature of the flour, 
the ripeness of your starter, how much protein is in your flour. That's why when you find one that works for you, I don't encourage you to switch around. Really pick one recipe and master it and then start playing with it after that. So I'm gonna dip my hands in the water. You can see it's much more elastic at this point. The glutens are developing. The dough tightens up pretty daggone quick. And I, when I pick up the dough, I actually pick it up off the bowl when I let the dough almost stretch itself. And I'm gonna let the dough rest for probably three hours. It's gotten warmer in here. Cover it lightly with a towel. You can set your plastic dough scraper on the top so that your tea towel doesn't stick to the dough. And we're gonna put this somewhere out of the way. And we'll come back and we'll shape the dough and put it in the banneton. Okay. Our dough has been resting for just about four hours, I would say. It's fairly loose in its consistency. We're going to go ahead and loosen it up from the bowl. I work my dough right on the butcher block, so I dampen it lightly just to create a moisture barrier. I don't want it sopping wet. You can see the dough is very, very loose. We're going to slightly pre-shape it just to give it some structure, and then we're going to prepare our banneton. So for demonstration purposes, I'm using a round bowl. I lightly run it under the water. I have rice flour that I've ground. You can buy it at the grocery. And I run it around. I want a fairly thick coating on this. You can brush off the excess before you bake. We've pre-shaped our dough. We've prepared our banneton. Once again, I'm gonna just lift the dough. The wood really does want to stick to the dough. We're gonna turn it upside down. And I lightly put it in a square shape. You see that big old air bubble. It's tightened up even from the pre-shape. So I'm gonna take the corner, bring it over. I put my thumb here just to kind of hold it in place. I'm picking the dough up each time and putting it back down, pulling all the edges over. What we're doing is creating tension by pulling the dough over and creating a smooth side on the bottom, which will be the top of our dough eventually. And we're gonna roll it over. So this will be the top of our bread and then underneath, obviously, is the bottom. I take my hand and I go past it, which rotates the dough a little bit, and then I take pinky, ring, middle, and pull it under. So I'm tucking the dough under as I do that. And then past, tucking under, past, tucking under. This is really a rocking motion forward and back. I'm trying to create that nice, smooth dough and knitting together the bottom of the dough. It's a very small movement. When I'm teaching classes, this seems to be the one process that confuses people. When they see the dough spinning, they want to kind of go around and then do all of this, and they creep all over the table. And it's, I'm staying in a very small area. And the tension is getting tighter and tighter. This, I, I don't add any bench flour ever, but it just could really turn. Take my knife, and I invert the dough into the banneton. If your dough wants to come apart, just give it a little pinch. We're gonna cover up the dough. It's gonna stay in the refrigerator overnight and then we're gonna bake it. In the 11 years that I've been baking with sourdough, I've changed up my tools and my baking methods to suit what works for me. I bake bread on Saturday mornings and sell it in my farm market here on the farm. When I first started baking with sourdough, I did bake in a Dutch oven. I had really good success with that. I baked at a little lower oven temperature than I do now. Currently I bake at 500 degrees. My stove runs really hot and I have a baking stone in the bottom on the bottom rack of my oven. I like using the baking stone because I can do two loaves at a time and also I don't know whether I'm just headlong or clumsy or what, but when I was using a Dutch oven, I burned myself more times than I like to admit. I've always enjoyed baking and making things from scratch, 
years ago I purchased a super peel and that was done to be able to put a very thin wet dough for pizza on the peel and then transfer it onto the hot stone. I really had trouble getting the pizza to let go of a regular peel. So this works good for me. You put it on your item on here, you set it on the stone and then you pull your peel back and it transfers on. By being able to bake two loaves at a time, I average four loaves an hour on Saturday morning. So I get up early and then I'm able to get enough to meet the demand or come close to it anyway. Once I transfer my bread onto the hot stone, I cover it with a large roasting pan lid and I usually rinse this under water before I invert it onto the dough and there will be just a little bit of water on the top of the lid. I don't want the water to pour out, but I do like a little bit of moisture on top of the lid. I think it adds a little steam and since I've been doing that, my crust is much more tender and you'll see that in the end. And I'm going to demonstrate now how I score my dough and transfer it to the oven and bake it. I'm only going to do one dough at a time so that you can see. Store it overnight in the refrigerator. It's covered. And I usually dust it with just a little bit of rice flour on the top while it's still in the banneton. This will be inverted onto the stone and I think the rice flour just creates a little bit of barrier between the dough and the hot stone. I'm going to take this and I'm going to make sure that it's going to let go around the edges just by lightly pulling away. This is a high hydration dough, so once I start working with it, I want to get it in the oven as quickly as possible. I'm going to invert it onto the easy peel. I'm going to brush off any decorative scoring I do first before I do my deep slash. I hold my lum at about a 45 degree and I go from side to side. And now we're gonna put it in the oven quickly. My oven's been preheating for just about an hour. I'm gonna transfer the dough onto the stone. You can hear the steam, the water running off of the lid into that. And I'm gonna cover it. I'm gonna bake it for just about 17 minutes covered. Okay, the first part of our bake is done, covered. We'll remove the lid and I'm going to transfer it onto a baking rack to go ahead and let it brown. That's about as dark as I like the bottom of the loaf, which is one of the reasons why I go ahead and elevate it on the second part of the bake. Set the timer for five minutes for the second part. Okay, our time's up. I have an Insta Read thermometer. I'm going to check the internal temperature of the bread. I like for it to be right around 200. It's 210. I don't want a gummy bread inside, so it's important that the internal temperature be right. And I'm going to transfer this to a cooling rack. While that's cooling, we'll go ahead and score the oval banneton and we're going to bake it the same way. Spread that around. Make sure that our dough is going to let go from the edges. Take my bread lom. Do my decorative score. The one thing I like about using the roasting pan is that it's already cool. Transfer the dough. This has a little bit of moisture inside of it. I've rinsed it out again. Cover it up and we'll set the timer for 17 minutes. This time we'll just take a peek. Rinse out my banneton real quick and I'll set it on the back of the stove to dry. The first one's already pretty dry. 
from being on top of the stove. The bread is very squishy and yummy. We're gonna do one big cut right through the middle. Mm, boy, it doesn't get any prettier than that, I'm gonna tell you. Nice and yummy. When I first started baking, I didn't bake under the roasting pan lid and I was trying some different things and I never got this soft exterior crust like I do now. Get a little bit of a taste. Let's see, it's a really nice, soft loaf. So the bread's nice and tender. Please don't get discouraged in the process. I can tell you there is no one who's baked more loaves that didn't turn out probably than me. Um, so stick with it. Enjoy the process. I always knew that I wanted to bake a loaf a certain way and honestly this is it so I'm very very pleased. My favorite way to store the bread is on a wooden cake plate. Uh, once the bread's cut I store it cut side down cover it with the glass dome and the bread would keep very soft for probably four or five days. We usually eat the loaf before then. Um, if you don't have that, you can always store it in a thin plastic bag. I've tried using the beeswax wraps. I didn't have a great luck with that. Um, but this works better for me than anything. Um, it's attractive. It sits out on the counter, and I don't have to deal with the plastic, which I really like. Um, enjoy baking, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks.